I came out of the pen against Vanderbilt. That was when, like, Carson Fulmer was there. Uh, Dansby Swanson was on the team. The stands were packed, absolutely packed with professional scouts. I didn't think I was going to pitch. So I was just, you know, bullcrapping in the, in the dugout, and <laughs> I didn't have my jersey on. I didn't have my cleats on. I had nothing on. Welcome, everyone, to Episode 7 of ITTV. This is a pretty awesome uh, series we've got going. It's the Pro Series. For the next two weeks or so, we're going to have on a bunch of different guys that have been involved in some way, shape, or form in pro ball. Tonight, I'm really excited to kind of kick it off locally, uh, since we are a local organization, with two guys from around the area, around the Indianapolis area. We've got Southport represented in Franklin Community High Schools. So I guess let's just get right into it. After, I first give a thank you to everyone who subscribed to our YouTube page to get us up to enough followers so we can say youtube.com slash Indiana Twins. It just looked like a mess before that. Uh, if you guys want to follow us on there or anywhere on social media, make sure you go to at Indiana Twins. And if you have any questions about any of our guests, any of the things that they said, anything from us, you can always email us at indianatwins at gmail.com. So with that said, I first want to introduce the younger one of the bunch. This guy went to Southport High School, left-handed pitcher. I want to say he's like 6'1", I don't know, 190, give or take or so like that. Now I might be up 200? Like okay. 205, 210. Okay, That's 205. Uh, first introduced to this guy when he was with our organizations, organization a few years back. And then a common theme with both of these guys is, what I write down, kind of a whatever it takes mentality because – Although Avery, who I'm about to introduce, um, was only with our organization for a brief amount of time, it was because he was constantly doing just whatever it took, uh, whether it was seeking out a different facility and a training complex, um, the best guys in the country with a, bit, with a great family support. And the same thing with Jeremy, too. Um, I remember the first time uh, when I coached Jeremy, hearing about him before I really met him, that he was going across the country to go and seek out kind of the best camps and showcases and just whatever it took. So with all that said, I want to introduce first Avery Short, who was drafted last year in 2019 with the Diamondbacks. He can talk a little bit more about that. But uh, Avery, go ahead and tell us a little bit about kind of where you're at right now, and then we'll follow up from there. Yeah, um, right now just kind of waiting to see what's going to happen with obviously pro ball and stuff, just working out at home and kind of just waiting to eventually get back out there. It's getting a little boring, so. Yeah. So where were you drafted? Twelfth uh, round. Twelfth round. You remember what number pick? No. <laughs> okay, not really that important. No, that's pretty awesome. Uh, so first thing I want to ask you, Avery, is about because you guys both have really unique and completely different stories on your careers and your paths. So I want to hear about your uh, experience with the USA national team, and then also I'm curious if that was the first time you had a baseball card. Um. It actually wasn't the first time I had my own baseball card because just a few months before that, I was in the Under Armour All-American game, and we got them there, too. Gotcha. So I was lucky enough to get two while I was in high school. It was pretty cool. Yeah. But, um, I mean, playing for Team USA was one of the best experiences I've had to date. It was – I guess my favorite part was being able to represent my country while doing my favorite thing in the world. And um, it was great meeting new guys, playing against the best players in my age all over the world and playing with the best players in my country and stuff. So I guess it was just like a dream come true for me. Yeah. How much time did you spend with those guys? Like, did you guys have practices? Did you have a ton of games? I mean, what was the layout for that, all that? Yeah. Um, so I spent about two weeks with everybody over the summer as like a tryout. And then – Come fall in October, I believe, we went down to Florida for a week. And that's when they cut the team down to the final 20. And then we went down to Panama for two weeks. And we had practices every day. And I think in Panama, we ended up playing like 11 or 12 games. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Let's kick it back over to Jeremy. So this guy, you know, like I said, I coached when I was a uh, pitching coach at Franklin Community. And he was one of the first guys that um, I recognized had a lot of talent. And I don't know if I ever told Jeremy this uh, or if he knows this, but kind of the scouting report on him was um, 
I don't want to say out of control, but lacked some control, but it just was a dog eat dog mentality. And I said, okay, I mean, it doesn't sound like there's much to develop from a talent standpoint other than just let's hone in that talent. That's really all it was. I was really gifted in my first couple of years getting to coach some really talented guys and, uh, you know, kind of just let them go and do their work and maybe just reset their focus. So uh, Jeremy was drafted by the Washington Nationals in 2017. Uh, he also played at Indiana State. And um, Jeremy, you can touch on some other schools. You jumped around a little bit, but uh, let's uh, hear what your – yeah, go into that for just a real brief second about – because I know that you had committed and decommitted and, you know, where were, where were you after Frank? Well, I, I, at a high school, I originally committed to uh, University of Cincinnati. And uh, it was probably two weeks before school. Actually, it was probably about three weeks before school was about to start. And uh, they actually, Cincinnati, uh, they let their head coach go. Um, so I was trying to figure out who the new head coach was going to be just because, you know, scholarship-wise, was it going to be there or not? And uh, – they couldn't let, they wouldn't let me know. And they said that we couldn't let you know yet. And I was like, all right, well, this is kind of sketching me out a little bit. And so I, uh, I decommitted from there and decided to go to junior college. Um, I spent my first semester at Iowa Western Community College. And then um, I actually transferred to Northwest Florida State Community College for my first year of uh, college baseball. And then, um, so I played that full season there. And then um, Coach Hannah's at Indiana State reached out to me um, along with Coach Smiley. Um, and they offered me a good scholarship. And I told myself I wasn't going to leave junior college unless I got over 65% scholarship. And, I mean, they happened to be over that. And so I decided to go ahead and come back to Indiana and play college baseball. Yeah. So you're at Indiana State. And I'd actually texted you because I was curious. I assumed, because I know I watched you at least once or twice on national TV, um, what was that like being on national TV, as you pretty much alluded to numerous times? Because um, obviously you're playing at a D1 level. I play in a really competitive uh, schedule. You're getting a pitch and all that good stuff. But just being on national TV, what was that like? Um, before the game starts and you know it's going to be national TV, you're, you're pumped up, you're excited and, and whatnot. But once you actually hit that mound and – you don't even you don't even think about it. It's not even on your mind. You have you have no idea that the cameras are even there. At least in my standpoint, um, that's just kind of how I was. I didn't I didn't care about who was in the stands and and what cameras were on me and whatnot. But um, just getting to pitch on national TV is it's pretty cool. Um, it's an exciting feeling. And usually the teams you pitch on national television against are are pretty solid teams. Yeah. Um, they're not just a small division one college. They're usually like your, your Vanderbilt, your Louisville's and stuff like that. Um, so when you pitch against those guys, it's one, you're going to compete as hard as you can. And, but two, I mean, you don't even realize they're there once the game actually starts. Yeah. I mean, is that completely the truth? Like there was no, was it right after the first pitch, the nerves went away. There weren't as many nerves once you took them out. Like, when did it really, like, settle down? I think, like, I think my nerves settled down once once I hit that bullpen. So, I started um, for a few years in, at Indiana State. And uh, when I hit the bullpen to basically get ready for my start, everything went away. Um, I didn't care how good the team was. I didn't care if the guy was number one overall – going to be the number one overall pick. Um I, I just basically competed as well as I possibly could. And um, as soon as I hit that bullpen, getting ready to, to throw my first warm-up pitch, um, I, everything went away. All, all I knew was, was hit that zone, um, compete against batters, and, and try to win every pitch. Yeah. Avery, what about your experience? Um, I don't know if you were on national television with a couple of the tournaments you were in, but – definitely with the national team. What was your experience like being on national TV? Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty much the same thing, like, before the game. The first time I was on national TV was at Wrigley Field in the Under Armour All-American game, and I wasn't really nervous or anything until I actually stepped onto the field, and then it kind of hit me. And then I was just kind of, like, chill, just settled down and stuff. And then once I started jogging in, 
it all kind of hit me again and got nervous. But once I threw my first pitch, like warm up pitch, I was fine. You kind of, like Jeremy said, you kind of just forget everything that's going on and just play baseball. Yeah. I'm actually going to skip that to another question because this is kind of relevant to that. So, Avery, do you remember um, or have a game that was your worst outing, like a first outing, whether it was a tournament with a different team, uh, your first high school appearance, your first pro ball appearance? Do you remember one of them being just terrible because it was your first one? Um. I would say probably my first appearance in Hillsborough this year was not the best. It wasn't awful, but it was probably one of my worst because I I was a little nervous just because it was a packed packed stadium and stuff, and I just got called up. And I walked the first two guys, but I ended up getting out of it, so it wasn't terrible. Yeah. Were you shaking? Because I remember my first college outing. I played <laughs> Division II, not as near as good as you guys. But I remember my first outing just like shaking and it was a hard time to make it through the first inning because I just, I couldn't stop shaking and I didn't think I could be able to throw the ball forward. Uh, no, I wasn't shaking. I was just kind of nervous. But after I threw a few, I kind of started dialing and figure it out. Well, that's why you guys are where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, what about you? Any of them that were just? Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe, yeah. I, uh, my, same thing for me. My first year of Pro Bowl. Um, I went to a uh, short season and I got freaking lit. I got lit up. Um, I went to state college, the Cardinal short season, and I've never seen a team hit better than them. And, uh, they, I mean, they rattled me. They got, they got into my head and I did the same thing. I, I started walking guys and, uh, about three guys later, the kid hits a grand slam off of me and it just, it threw me for a loop. I was like, dang, this is reality now. Any nerves for you, like any shaking? Or is it, am I the only one that trembles? See, I didn't shake. If I shook, it was because I was mad. Because um, <laughs> uh, I, know, I know I'm know i better than that, and I know I shouldn't have ever walked four, or three guys in a row. Um, but, if, I mean, like, kind of like Avery said, I mean, once you run onto that, fit, that field, you're, you're nervous at first. But the minute you throw that first warm-up pitch, it's just – you're, you're in the game. It's, there's nothing else to think about other than competing against those hitters. That's awesome. So let's talk about, you know, before you got to pro ball, the draft day. What was that like for you? Um, were you around people? Were you just kind of hanging out and hoping your phone would ring? Or what was your experience like, Jeremy? Um, I, was actually, I was actually building uh, in-ground pools um, <laughs> on the day that uh, I got the call. Um, I was drafted late, so I was a, I was a third-day pick. Um, but I was at work building a holes and, um, I was in the middle of shoveling concrete when I got the call from my agent that, and he told me congrats. And I wasn't sure what he was even talking about at first. And cause I, I, it, the, the whole tracker was kind of behind a little bit. Yeah. So I didn't even know my name was called. And, and then like two minutes later, I got the notification that I was uh, drafted by the nationals and I was like, Oh, okay. Now I know what you're saying. Congrats for. And, He's like, uh, yeah. So then um, about 10 minutes later, I got a call from the scout that uh, had picked me. And he's like, hey, you ready to get out here? And I'm like, well, yeah, I am. But, like, let's like let's see what's going on. Like, figure out what the contract is. Like, and Avery knows it's signing bonus stuff. Like, it's, it's all negotiable, um, which, like I said, I was a late guy. So I didn't get a ton of money, but I, I wanted to make sure that I had my the rest of my education paid for. Um, and it, it was an exciting time, but it's the draft is nothing like what you think it, it's going to be. It's uh, People can tell you, oh, you're going to go this pick, you're going to go this round. They don't know anything other than about the first five guys that are probably going to go. Is that frustrating for you? No, I mean, I knew I wasn't a top top five round guy I mean for me it was I got the chance to go play pro ball you know yeah. um I was a redshirt junior I had a medical hardship in college and I got the chance to go play pro ball so I took it and I had fun with it fair enough Avery what about you what was draft day like for you um well draft day for me was actually like a full three-day process which was a little tiring I guess because going into my senior season I had a chance to be a day one pick 
because of the summer I had after my junior year and stuff, as long as I kind of performed like I did. Mm -hmm. But I ended up not performing the best I could my senior year. And so um, I was at home with my family and my extended family was over there too, just in case it happened on day one. And um, we watched it and stuff, but I ended up going day three and it was a little different because they drafted me. I got a call from my agent that they were going to draft me in the 12th round and they did. And I got a call from the area scout and um, he told me that, that they picked me, but that they were just going to kind of hold on for a little bit because they were getting all the uh, higher picks out there to try and see how much money they would have left over to try and meet my numbers. So it ended up being like a pretty long process, but it worked out. So it's good. That's awesome. All right. Next question. Let's see here. This one, I'm curious about this because I never had to deal with this, but I know it's unbelievably common now, whether it's through travel ball, through college and got in like Jeremy, you were saying with, you know, having coaches leave and that kind of stuff, then meeting pro ball. So, Avery, what's it been like over the last just couple of years where you've had multiple travel coaches, multiple national coaches, multiple, you know, now you have pro ball coaches, high school. What's that been like to manage, like to navigate through all that? Um, for me, it's been pretty easy and pretty good because what I like to do is kind of I listen to everybody and see what they have to say. And then I kind of, I try some stuff out and I kind of just pick and choose what works best for me from every guy. And I, I feel like that's kind of helped me get to where I am and just having an open mind and trying stuff, so. Yeah. What would your, would you advise people to do the same thing or like if someone else is going through that and they've got one after the other, you know, a new pitching coach and let's, I guess let's say maybe they haven't done their homework before and they kind of just get thrust in the situation and now they've got one coach and six months later it's another one and they just don't really have as good of a foundation or education as you might. Yeah, I mean, I would recommend to not just go looking for a bunch of pitching coaches, but if you happen to be playing for different teams and doing different stuff and there are different guys at every event, then I guess I would try to handle it kind of like I did and listen to everybody and just be open and kind of figure out what works for you. Yeah. Jeremy, what about you? I'm sure, you know, with college kind of jumping around, you had – couple guys that you maybe worked with very briefly or not at all, and then a couple others, and now pro ball, you've been, you know, a few years with pro ball. What's that been like? Yeah, kind of like uh, Avery said, you just got to listen. Um, those guys are there for a reason, um, especially pro ball. I mean, they're not, not professional pitching coordinators for a reason or coaches for a reason. Um, they're there. They're, they want to help you. They want to help you get better. Obviously, it looks, it looks good on them if – they're the ones coaching you and you're, you're moving up in the ranks. Um, same thing for, for college. Um, you have a pitching coach there that's, that's helping you listen. If uh, something doesn't feel right, you just got to be truthful with yourself um, and with your coach. If something's not working right or something doesn't feel comfortable, um, you, you need to communicate. Um, let them know that, oh, this grip isn't right or, or I don't feel like I'm getting extension on something and um, they'll fix it. They're there for you. They're, I mean, they're, yeah, they're getting paid, but they want you to succeed. They, they don't want you to fail because it's going to look bad on them if you fail. Yeah. So the next question, Jeremy, is about kind of, and this is a pretty broad question. I wish I could make more specific, but I'm just curious. It could be anything. What's been kind of at the core of your success as a pitcher? Uh, kind of lay the foundation, something that you've always fallen back on, whether it's a, a mentality you've got, a performance type of, contraption a coach a go-to book like um nutrition what what's been kind of at your core for success yeah. i uh i hate to admit it but i don't read very much um <laughs> i just threw that in yeah um I, I just always have had the mentality that i am the underdog and i gotta prove myself to to get where i want to be so um any hitter i faced it was you're gonna get my all and I'm, I'm going to beat you. And if I didn't beat that person, the next person, I'm going to beat them. And I'm going to get the inning. Um, everybody has bad innings. Everybody gives up runs. Nobody's perfect. But um, my mentality was always to go after the person. Um, 
and I, I give lessons and I tell kids like, don't be scared to hit somebody. If somebody's yeah. crowding your plate, throw it inside, hit them. That's fine. As a, as a pitching coach, I wouldn't, I would never be mad. Um, but I, I, I like to attack hitters and yeah. make them know that that's my plate and it's not theirs. You said underdog mentality, that, that word or that phrase gets thrown around. Um, and it may not have as like deep of a level of, um, meaning to you, but when did that start? Uh, was it when you were young? Was it a certain time? Was it, um, something aggravate you to something motivate you to feel that way or I've, I mean, I've always thrown pretty hard. I mean, growing up, I, I threw pretty hard and, um, but when I got to high school, I mean, I'm six foot, I'm not anything. I'm not a giant, you know? And when you, especially when you get to pro ball, man, there's guys that are six, 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 seven. I mean, Avery knows, and, um, you, you're competing against those guys for a spot. They're your teammates, but you're still competing against them to, to get a spot on a team. And if, if you don't go in with the attitude that I'm going to beat him, I'm going to, I'm going to get that spot. And he's not, those, those guys are going to, I mean, they're, they're going to trample over you, you know, and usually those taller guys have the, have the bigger advantage of throwing the baseball to the plate. And you just got to have that dog mentality that you're, you're going to do whatever it takes to, to beat somebody out. Was there any ever, because I remember my, when I um, walked on to play in college, I don't know if you guys had this moment, I'd be curious, but I remember walking in to try out to make the team and just looking up at everyone, I'm six foot as well, and just looking up at everyone around me that was all like six, three and above. And I'm like, what, what am I doing here? Yeah. I mean, did you ever have that experience? Like where you just, maybe there was a player where you're just like, this guy's unbelievable. Even though I'm pretty good, I feel like pretty confident, but this guy's unreal. Yeah, I uh, one of my teammates at Indiana State was Jeff Degano. He was drafted by the Yankees in the compensation round, and he's like six five, and he's a lefty. He's a stud. And uh, when I was throwing with him and stuff, it's just kind of like, and I got a, I got a lot of work to do if I'm going to be a guy like this. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, I wasn't drafted as high as he was, but um, I felt like I still competed and and did what I had to do to uh, make my college career a good one. Yeah. Avery, did you ever have anyone like that you ran into? Um, actually, the my first teammate that I met, I walked into the locker room and uh, another left-handed pitcher was standing there and he kind of welcomed me and he was like 6'6", full beard. And so I was like, wow, like now I'm playing with grown men. So <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So Avery, what's been at the, the core of your success as a pitcher? Um. I guess the thing that I kind of always go back to is just staying true to myself and my strengths as a pitcher, which is mostly my pitch ability is kind of what's gotten me to where I am. And so always just kind of slowing the game down and thinking, but not thinking too much has kind of always been my go-to. Where did that come from? Um, it came from the twins, I guess. I mean, you guys, you guys taught it, and I, I guess I was just kind of natural at it and picked it up fairly easy, and it just stuck with me. No, so that's always just. Oh, I'm trying to pull up Facebook. Sorry, I apologize. To try and get some of these comments, but no, I appreciate the shout out. But what do you remember? What age it was that you kind of picked up on that? It would have been around 11 or 12, probably. Okay. Cause I got the, I got the chance cause my older brother, he's four years older than me. So I, and he played for the first twins team there was. And so I was kind of always around them and practiced with them sometimes and kind of just got to be around the older guys, which helped a lot. So, yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's crucial to develop. I mean, I talked to some of the guys last week about just, we had a 16 U player who was talking about, how much of the kind of the mental training had helped him. And I'd kind of asked him the same question and he had said a lot of the mental training that we do. And it's not to like um, plug our mental training, which is great, but even with it, you still have some guys that still can't gain that perspective. So it's impressive to always hear guys, you know, like yourself and that player, Charlie, just to really grasp that and to mature. And I think in order to have success at any level, let alone get drafted, um, be able to be continue to have that success, you got to have a strong head in your shoulders, a bit of maturity that's a little bit above the guys around you. 
Um, I mean, you can also have freak talent as well, but um, if you don't have that mentality too, then that's not always the best long-term. So I'm very impressed. Uh, next question. Let's stick with you, Avery. Um, so your college recruiting experience, this was the most common question that I got from guys responding on Instagram was about college recruiting. So your experience was unique to Jeremy's because he went and played at a handful. You made the decision, which I'm sure wasn't easy to um, enter the draft. Uh, so tell me about kind of your recruiting experience. I know you talked to some of our players on site about it, but when did it start for you? When did it actually like get really serious for you where you're like, okay, I really need to start taking this serious. Um, and then even up to when you kind of had to make that decision. Yeah. Um, the first time that it started and I actually talked to a college coach was the fall of my freshman year, which is pretty early. It's getting more normal now, but at the yeah. time it was pretty early. Yeah. And um, I guess once I got off the phone, I kind of realized that like I had that potential and that that was going to be a thing for me and that kind of motivated me to just work even harder and stuff to get past that level but uh the recruiting process for me was it was good but it was kind of stressful because I kind of went through the same thing Jeremy did a little bit uh, I was committed to Indiana and then the coach left and it was actually while I was trying out for Team USA and um so I was stuck trying to figure all that out while trying to perform and stuff. But once I figured that out, I decommitted from Indiana and uh, ended up committing to Louisville. But I enjoyed the process. It was really cool. Made some good friends and stuff. So, Yeah. Um, when I talked to the, the Earlham squad from a couple of days ago last week, there a couple of them had mentioned it's kind of the same situation as you guys, whether it was coaching or whatever they were transferring. And it's so easy. I know if I was like a high schooler listening and hearing people say, oh, you know, I decommitted and then, you know, I committed here. It just, you know, we just talk about it nonchalantly. But to me as a high schooler, I'm probably thinking like, what in the world does that really mean? Though? Like, what does that entail? Yeah, I know I'm committed to go there and I uncommit for circumstances and I go somewhere else, but like, it can't be that easy. Oh, hey, you know, well, you know, I'm gonna push a button, I'm decommitted and then I'm gonna look over here and hey, can I come play? Like, what did that really look like for you? Um, well, it was a lot of phone calls, some of them not so great, having to tell schools, no, not interested, or it's just not the right fit, and, and calling to decommit obviously wasn't a great call, but um, I guess it was, it was good. It was... You, did you have to make that call? <laughs> yeah. Yep. I think that's important to stress because, I mean, so many coaches at every level, they expect ownership and accountability on the players. So that's a big time call. I can't imagine that call for you. Yeah, I was definitely nervous, but I was lucky because I called a coach that was leaving Indiana and he was obviously very understanding. And then I called the coach that was coming to Indiana, uh, Jeff Mercer, who was a great guy. And he was totally understanding and really helpful and good on that, on that side. That's awesome. Jeremy, what about you? What, what did that look like? Kind of the back and forth and jumping around and, you know, you went to a couple of different schools and that, that could not have been easy. Yeah, it was a, I mean, it's a kind of a roller coaster of emotions. Um, I loved going to Cincinnati. I mean, I loved visiting there. And I had a, a friend on the team already um, that I knew from Ron Colley and, uh, but once I found out their their coach got um, let go, it, like Avery said, it's a bunch of phone calls. I mean, it's a process, and it's not just something you can call and say, "Hey, I don't I don't think I'm going to come there anymore." It's uh it's paperwork, um, and if you if your coach doesn't get let go and you just decide to decommit, um, I'm pretty sure you have to sit out a year. Um, which is no fun. You don't nobody wants to miss their first season of college baseball. Yeah, no kidding. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a process and it's it's not an easy one. I mean, it's not something you can just I mean, obviously like Avery said, Jeff Mercer, amazing dude. Everybody loves him. I love him. He's a great guy. Um, he's an easy guy to talk to. Not all coaches are like that. Uh, so you kinda gotta you really gotta make sure that the school you're gonna choose is is the one that you really wanna go to. 
Um, I went to three different schools. Um, so it's just, a, it, it's something you have to really be dedicated to. Um, but when I got to Indiana State, coaches were awesome. They're, they're amazing guys, really laid back. But when it's time to play, they, they're they going to play. Yeah. So speaking of dedication and <clears throat> taking a lot, a lot of time, I'm um, getting a couple questions on when did scouting – so two questions, Jeremy, and for you, Avery, as well. Uh, so, Jeremy, when did you start getting scouted by professional scouts? And – the next question is, at what age did you think that you could actually play, not want to, but actually think professional baseball was a reality? Um, so my first year at Indiana State, I, uh, my, I think my first game, I came out of the pen against Vanderbilt, and I threw four innings, and I think I gave up like one hit. And that was when like Carson Fulmer – was there uh Dansby Swanson was on the team um and obviously the the stands were packed absolutely packed with professional scouts and um you weren't nervous then no like I I honestly just like I I was before the game actually here it's funny because I didn't think I was gonna pitch so I was just you know bullcrapping in the in the dugout and (laughs) I didn't have my jersey on I didn't have my cleats on I had nothing on, and um, Coach Hannah's yells down for me to go get loose in the pen, and I and I'm not kidding. I, I've never ran so fast in my life to get my my cleats and jersey on, and um, so I ran down to the bullpen. I'm I probably threw ten pitches, and I and I ended up being in the game, and uh, and I, I literally I threw amazing. Like I, I surprised myself, but I I, I uh, threw four innings, one I think one hit. And um, that next day, I had a few guys come up and say, like, a few scouts come up and start saying stuff to me. And uh, that was actually the year I got injured. And then the year after, I think I talked to, I don't know, seven or eight teams. And then the year I actually got drafted, I think I talked to just about uh, every pro team. Um, There may have been, like, one or two that I didn't have contact with. Um, but it's – I don't – like, I don't know how to really describe it, but it's, like, something you just got to let happen. You don't, you don't try to force it or anything like that. But when did I expect to start getting looked at by pro scouts? Um, or did I think I was going to get looked at by pro scouts? Um, I really didn't think anything of it until – probably my first year at Indiana state. That's kind of when it set in that I had the potential to actually make it to pro ball at some point in my life. I mean, your comment about um, sprinting and not having any of your cleats on or anything like that, your Jersey reminds me, and you guys probably haven't made it there yet, but being, you know, over 10, well, almost 15 years now removed from any type of um, competition at any level, I've had countless dreams, whether it's in football or baseball, where I don't have my equipment, I don't have my jersey, I'm like, just for whatever reason, not there. But in my dream, I I just can't get around quick enough. Someone else plays in front of me, and then I never get that opportunity to play again. And it's a a terrible nightmare. I hope you guys never have it. But when your career's down for a few years, just a little foreshadowing, you might run into some of that. But Avery, what about you? Um, I guess I didn't really – well, I got – I started getting scouted by pro scouts the summer after my junior year, once I started playing in uh, bigger events with kind of the best players in the country. And I, I feel like I, going into those, I wasn't really known by the pro scouts. Some of them knew who I was, but um, I guess once I finally pitched and saw all the pro scouts behind me and I performed, I guess that was kind of when I realized that I have the potential to play Pro Bowl, and so, yeah. That's awesome. All right, next question I got here. We'll kind of, you know, get you guys back down to earth a little bit. Avery, what did or do you struggle with as a pitcher? Um, I would say right now my biggest struggle is throwing off speed with the Pro Bowl. 
going from the high school to the pro ball, I struggled. My first year, I threw, I think I threw around 10 innings, which is low, but I only threw like six or seven off-speed pitches besides changeup. So I pretty much lived fastball changeup, which ended up being a good thing for me because I never really had a good changeup, so it gave me a chance to develop it. And I've learned that that is a very important pitch to throw. And it's very useful. But um, that's – I'd say that right now that's my biggest struggle. So tell everyone watching why it was a struggle with the pro ball. They're, they might be hearing, oh, in pro ball it was a struggle. But what do you really mean by it? Um, the difference in the seams. In high school they're a lot um, higher – so you can get a lot easier grip. And once you get to pro ball, they're a lot lower. And the ball, the leather on the balls are actually like a lot more slippery. So it's, it was just kind of a hard adjustment to make during the season. Yeah, for, for everyone out there that's ever been to a minor league game, major league game, or spring training game, and you get one of those balls, you can, I mean, if you just compare it to what is a high school or college ball, there's some drastic difference between some of them. So Jeremy, what about you? What, did you struggle with uh, what was a big thing, whether it kept coming up or what was one thing that just stands out that just you struggled with? Um, I can't throw a changeup to save my life. <laughs> and I've never really been able to. Um, but my first year of pro ball, I basically had fastball slider and I throw a changeup maybe once on a blue moon. Um, and then my second year, um, I actually threw like 97% fastballs in my second year of pro ball. Um, yeah. I think I threw probably 60-something innings, and there'd be games I wouldn't even throw a, a slider at all. I, uh, I, at the beginning of that year, I threw, I threw probably 12 sliders in one game, and the next time I threw, my slider was, it was like gone. Like I lost it. And – I just started – I was working with my pitching coach on trying to get my slider back. Um, but then I just – I went to my fastball, and I don't know what it was with my fastball that year, but that's basically the only thing I threw all year long, and it worked for me. Uh, I mean, I didn't have to worry about throwing other pitches. I was a nine inning, ninth inning guy. I closed games out a lot. So I didn't have to worry about coming in and facing the entire lineup or facing the lineup more than once if I did. I mean, I threw a max of probably three innings um, in a game all year. And um, the good thing about it was is I didn't have to show a, a secondary pitch because I didn't have to worry about facing guys more than once. Yeah. Was there a different mentality when you were, let's say, brought in randomly in the seventh inning or something for middle relief or yeah. you used to come in the ninth? Yeah, definitely. Um, when you come in the ninth inning, it's it's – you're going to throw your, your baseballs as hard as you possibly can if you're throwing a fastball. And if you're throwing off-speed pitches like a slider or a curveball, you're going to rip the crap out of them. Um, but when you come in in the seventh inning, it's more of a location, location, location kind of thing. Um, hit your spots. You're still going to want your velo there. Um, but you're not absolutely releasing your entire velo like you would in the ninth inning. Were you able to make the transition okay? Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that was uh, coming from college from starting to being a ninth inning guy to starting to be a ninth inning guy. It's, it, I think that helped me a lot. Yeah. Avery, what about you? Because I'm sure whether it's with, you know, perfect game and those tournaments or a different travel team or the national team and then high school, I know within one year you've probably done everything. What was the question? <laughs> what was that like for you? How was it transitioning between – I'm a starter one day, and you know, a month later, I'm a not closer. I'm a middle reliever. I'm a one batter type. I mean, what was that like for you? Um, for me, it was actually a pretty easy adjustment because it's kind of just it's pitching. It's the same. You have the same stuff. You know what you do best. And like like Jeremy said, there is a little different like intent in the different situations, but you got to know what you are out there to do and that's to get guys out and that's the ultimate goal so it's that's your only job yeah fair answer all right let's see avery what was your most difficult year or season or even a tournament or anything like that what was that like for you where you just were struggling 
relatively? Um, I wouldn't, I would say this year, like this past season was probably the most difficult, not baseball wise, but more off the field, just from obviously having to move across the country and be away from my family and friends and all that. But, um, I would say once I got to pro ball, it was kind of difficult because with the high school guys and pretty much all the pitchers, they took it really slow. Like I said, I threw about a total of 10 innings in three months. So it went by pretty slow. And I, I would say that was probably the hardest part was just waiting until I finally got my shot. Yeah. Who did you confide in during that time? Was it family? Was it buddies? Was it guys you kind of became pals with around the clubhouse? or? Could... Yeah, I would say it was probably my, my buddies around the clubhouse because they were going through the same thing. So it made it a little easier. Yeah, that's awesome. Jeremy, what about you? I would say this season as well. Um, I just – I didn't have it. I, uh, I I didn't have a slider. I didn't have a changeup. My fastball seemed flat. Um, nothing was working for me at all. Um, and I made adjustment after adjustment. And for some reason, I just couldn't – I couldn't find the velo. I couldn't, I couldn't really do much. Um, and I, I think it, it – I started to struggle with it a lot. And um, – Baseball is a mental game, and if you don't have the mental capacity to handle it, you're going to struggle. Yeah. Who were you able to confide in during that time? Um, I think some of the guys on the team became some of my lifelong best friends, um, and, and those are the guys that I kind of leaned on, and we all talked. And um, I mean, even they helped me. They, they would help me with stuff. Um, and Avery will find out eventually that – some of those kids you play with are, are going to become your lifelong best friends and you're, you're going to stick with them for, for a very long time. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay. Let's shift gears a little bit. Jeremy, you've been the older one. You've had more um, innings and games and minutes spent in the bullpen. And for any of you that's, that have never been a pitcher and just hung out in a bullpen, you have no idea what goes on in the bullpen. So any good shenanigan stories in the bullpen? Um, there's a lot of bad ones that I'm not allowed to talk about. <laughs> um, there's a lot of random conversations that get brought up. There's a lot of goofing around um, games. You play games in the bullpen constantly. Um, what, was mafia. what was the game you played? Mafia. Okay. Um, I don't know if Avery's ever played that. Yeah, we played on the bus. Yeah. I was like, we played on the bus, too, during the game, though. That's. Oh, yeah, we play it every day during the game, at least probably ten times a game. <laughs> and um, eventually it gets old, and you're like, dude, I just want to watch the game. <laughs> and uh, you got to try to hide it from your, your coach. Your head coach is staying in at third base while all guys are hitting. And, uh, but we, uh, we actually found a beetle one time crawling across the ground. And um, we had a kid that had – he, for some reason, had pine tar down. I think he was taping up a bat or something. And uh, we put it inside of the pine tar. And so he went in there to grab it, and he had a beetle. And I, I've never seen somebody freak out. Um, <laughs> he, he was definitely mad. And um, the kid that put the beetle in there, we went and uh, we traveled to somewhere else. And he ended up – the kid that put the beetle in there, um, the kid that – was using the pine tar, put eye black all in the rim of his hat. That so when he wore it, he took it off for running. <laughs> the kid had no idea, and everybody kept laughing at him, laughing at him, whatever. And his uh, his hat was ruined because it was just pitch black all the way across his forehead. <laughs> and uh, but that's just that's just one of them. I probably shouldn't talk about the rest or try it out loud, but yeah. it's a uh, you. You pay attention, but you don't. <laughs> yeah, we're not advising that you don't pay attention. But yeah, it's, it's pay, what, pay attention as much as you possibly can. Yeah. But, it's life uh, in the bullpen. Life of the bullpen is – it's fun and it's boring, so you find things to do. Yeah, it's exactly that, exactly boring and fun. Avery, what about you? Any good shenanigans stories or games or anything like that? Um, I don't really have any good shenanigans stories. I haven't spent that much time in the bullpen because I've always been a starter up until I got moved up to Hillsboro, the short season a team I went to. 
I mean, pretty much we just played games like 20 questions and stuff like that. That was pretty much it. There was no guys that were goofballs or anything? Oh, uh, there was. People doing dumb stuff. It was nice because uh, right behind our bullpen was a hangout spot for the kids. So they'd go to the concession stand and bring us food. So that was nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Dipping dots all day. <laughs> That's great. Jeremy, you would get dipping dots? Oh, yeah. Same thing. We had our bleachers were right uh, behind our, our bench, and kids would just bring us dipping dots, just drop them <laughs> down into the bullpen. <laughs> okay, Avery, what was your favorite ballpark food? Or what is? Um, probably nachos. Jeremy? Um, probably uh, chili cheese dog or nachos, yeah. Not dipping dots? Well, I mean, yeah, but that's just a – that's an yeah. extra. Yeah. The bonus. All right, let me see if I missed any of the more serious questions. Uh, I'm not seeing – any others? Let me double check. Um, Facebook real quick. If it loads up. Um, okay. My 11U player, we'll let Avery kick this off. My 11U player just had his biggest fear of losing his ability to throw his off-speed pitch. What would your advice be to him? Avery, go ahead. Um. I guess my advice would be just to keep keep going at it. Baseball takes a lot of practice, and that's what helped me get my off speed back this off season was just throwing it over and over. Not too much, obviously, but as much as I could while being safe. So just keep practicing it and getting better. Jeremy, what about you? Anything to add? Uh, I think mental reps is a big yeah. thing. Um, like Aver said, don't overthrow it, but getting mental reps in, um, mechanics, practicing mechanics, um, the mirror drill where you're in a mirror, you're facing it, um, practicing mechanics. And um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but my pitching coach, uh, my second year, gave me a uh, tennis ball case. Um, it had tape around it. And I practiced throwing my slider with that because one, it's light, and two, you're going to get that natural motion out of it from the spin if you throw it correctly. Yeah. But at, Everyone, 11, you... at 11 years old, I wouldn't overthrow any off-speed pitch. Yeah. Well, when you say mental reps, uh, we've got an 11-year-old who's wondering this. What in the world do you mean by a mental rep? Um, basically, vision yourself that – you're throwing against a batter. You don't have to. You don't have to go out on the field and stand in a mound. You can do literally do it inside of your room. Um, but vision yourself at a game or in a place that you want to be, and go through your motion of throwing an off-speed pitch. Um, get that feeling of where those fingers ought to be. Um, whether you're throwing a slider and they should they should be to the side, or you're throwing a curveball and you want them over the top. Get that mental rep of going through the motion and feeling where everything is at that time. I like it. All right. Got another question here. Whether or not you've played on it, um, Jeremy, what's your favorite major league field? Uh, I like Wrigley field. Okay. Avery? Is it a field that we've been to? Been to, played, seen, I mean, just your favorite ballpark. Okay, the so one that I've been to is Wrigley. Good. What's your second favorite since Jeremy already said that? <laughs> um, probably Chase Field, the Diamondback Stadium. Nice. All right. I think that's all of our serious ones and all of our questions for now. Um, let's see here. Oh, Jeremy, when did you get your first baseball card? My first year of Pro Bowl. Okay. Was that cool? Was it just like, oh, that's that's neat? Or was it like – It was pretty cool. I mean, I, I mean, other than the ones you had when you were, you know, you were little and got in Little League, like the little fake, fake cards, you know. But <laughs> definitely the first Pro Bowl card is, is awesome. Yeah. Avery, what was it like seeing your first Pro Bowl card? Um, it was it was awesome. 
just because like I'd already had two, but there was a difference because like I I earned these a little bit more and yeah. just kind of it was my life goal. So it was kind of first step in that direction. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. Yeah, my only baseball card was the one I made for my wedding for me and my uh, groomsmen. So that's, I'm pretty jealous of you guys. All right, I think that's all the serious ones. So we're going to go <clears> – <throat> I've got – Series of questions for each of you. They are rapid fire. So just kind of quick answers or you can expand them if you want. But also I'm going to start off with a specific one that I did a little bit of, not a ton of digging, but a little bit of digging. Uh, Avery, I told you that I reached out to one of your buddies. You don't know what I talked to him about, so I'm going to go to you last. Jeremy, I did some digging with you a little bit. Um, and it appears that you're a fan of the water. So do you have a favorite water story or activity that you, like, it's your favorite water activity? Water? Yep. On the water. On the lake? On the boat? Uh, I'm not a fan of water, per se. <laughs> okay. Um, I honestly think water's freaky because you can't fight it. Um, but I do love fishing. Okay. So I love being on a boat or on a dock. Or just on land itself um but i do love fishing i'll go in the ocean but nothing probably eh, belly button or, or higher okay fair enough i did see it one of a tweet somewhere deep in your twitter about fishing and i thought i saw something about water too but yeah, that was interesting enough all right so other rapid fire questions what's your favorite movie um oh gosh by the rookie. Okay. Um, favorite non-baseball activity or hobby? Ping pong. Nice. What are you not good at? Golf. How not good are you at it? Um, I'm hit and miss, but when, when I'm hitting, it's still not good. <laughs> and when you're missing, you're literally missing? Uh, yeah. Like, you can't find – I go through about 100 balls. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm, I'm on the same boat. And last one, something people don't know about you. Um, I did gymnastics when I was little. You think it helped you? I think it made me a little more athletic. Did it for about two or three years. I remember watching you sprint at – now, for those of you that don't know, the cardinal rule for pitching, you don't feel – you don't get a pop fly. You just – you run away. Like, get away. Don't let the pitcher – he's not an athlete. We don't want him hurt. You don't catch a pop fly. I remember you sprinting off the mound, diving completely 100% laid out and catching a ball. I don't know if it was a bunt or a dink of a hit or something. And it was a bunt. We were, we were both, we were all frustrated and also amazed at the same time. That was, yeah. That was when I used to be athletic. <laughs> all right, Avery, you've been waiting an hour and a half for this or maybe all day. So this is a uh, one or the other. You have to pick one, and I want to know why. Golf or Call of Duty? That's hard. Um, I would say golf because it's something physical, and I like being outside, and I like being able to physically do stuff, and so and it's fun. Yeah. I mean, try not to get too mad. The other day I played – Worst round I've ever played for, by far, and uh, got a little mad. But other than that, I'm normally just out there to relax and have fun. Yeah. How long have you been playing? Because Nick said you were pretty good. Um, I've been playing. I started first time I ever swung a golf club was like freshman year of high school because my older brother was getting into it. So obviously I wanted to do what he was doing, but um, and I was very bad. I couldn't even hit the ball off the tee, and so um. But I guess ever since my freshman year, I've been playing, getting better a little bit every year. Yeah. All right. What's your favorite movie? Step Brothers. Good. Uh, favorite non-baseball activity or hobby? Um, either golf or just hanging out with my buddies. Okay. What are you not good at? Apparently, you're good at golf and you're good at baseball. What are you not good at? basketball like I used, you, to, I used to be decent and then for some reason i just am awful now <laughs> so it just all went out maybe it's because of golf yeah. 
probably yeah. traded out the golf for the basketball, which is good. I like it. <laughs> That's good. And then last one, something people don't know about you. Well, I also did gymnastics when I was little, but um, I gave a different one. I would just say that I'm a big family guy, like family man. And it's one of the most important things to me. And I guess that was one reason it was kind of difficult adjusting going to Arizona this year, being away from family. So That's awesome. <clears throat> All right, last thing. Avery, you can kick it off. We'll end on this. Advice to younger athletes, just in general, whatever you've got. Um, I would just say stay true to yourself. Know your – know your game, know your strengths and weaknesses and play to your strengths and work on your weaknesses and just know who you are. Good. What's the, what would be the best way to figure out who you are? Cause that's tough for kids. Yeah. Um, I guess just practice and really evaluating your performance and seeing what you do best. Good. All right, Jeremy advice. Uh, same thing. Um, know what you do best. Um, if you do one thing better than the other, um, keep practicing the good thing. Work even harder on the bad thing. Um, listen to your coaches. Um, they're there to help. Um, sometimes they give not great advice, but sometimes they give great advice. Um, so listen. Um, stay true to yourself. Do, do what you think is right and, and, and work hard and, and be a dog. Jeremy, anything to add before we – anything fun? Any, any other notes of any kind? I don't think so, no. All right. Avery, I just – this just came up from Alec. Broke a three-driver head. What happened? Yeah, I have broken three drivers when I was learning to play. I, my swing used to be so bad. Yeah. I, the first time I went to the driving range, I broke Scotch driver. You can imagine he wasn't too happy about that. So, <laughs> yeah. Anything else to add, Avery? No. Nope. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate it. Um, if you want to stick on, you can. I'm going to end this right here. But, uh, everyone, appreciate you tuning in. And this week, like I said, it's awesome. These guys did a great job kicking off. We've got Steve Merriman with the Colorado Rockies on Wednesday. We've got Zan Barksdale on Friday. He's kind of your – he's the catching one-on-one -on -one guy, and he's, you know, had time in pro ball and – been all around as an instructor so thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll see you in episode eight all right we are ended i appreciate it guys yeah, thank yeah you. thanks for having us um this will obviously be on social media and i'll be uploading it to youtube um at some point since we're doing three of these a week it's hard to clip up things but if i get any um, like snippets that are kind of noteworthy that you guys ever want to use for anything, feel free. Um, it's going to be, we're not going to post this and try to make money or do any programs off of it. So anything that you see, you know, fair game to take and clips and do whatever you want with it. All right. Cool. Awesome. All right well, we'll see you guys later. Appreciate it. Later, thank All right. You. See you.